The man's rages became more and more common. In meetings, he would pace back and forth, ranting and screaming. Then suddenly he would drop to the floor and start chewing the edges of the carpet, growling like a wild animal. Can you imagine being in a meeting with someone like that? How much worse watching the leader of your country, for that's who the man was, descend into such mindless viciousness. The people who witnessed these terrifying manifestations in Adolf Hitler were afraid to speak about them except in whispers to close friends. In disgust, they called him a carpet eater. And the German word they used described a carpet eating beast. But had Hitler gone insane? That's what people thought. Or could it have been something else? And if it was something else, what could that mean for the future of the world? Welcome to Patterns of Supernatural Phenomena. The report of Hitler's bestial rages is found in William Shirer's classic 1961 book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Shirer was a journalist during the rise of the Reich before World War II. Here is his report of an experience dated September 22, 1938. I quote, Hitler was in a highly nervous state. On the morning of the 22nd, I was having breakfast on the terrace of the Hotel Dressen where the talks were to take place when Hitler strode past on his way down to the riverbank to inspect his yacht. He seemed to have a peculiar tick. Every few steps he cocked his right shoulder nervously, his left leg snapping up as he did so. He had ugly black patches under his eyes. He seemed to be, as I noted in my diary that evening, on the edge of a nervous breakdown. Tepish Fressa muttered my German companion, an editor who secretly despised the Nazis. And he explained that Hitler had been in such a maniacal mood the last few days that on more than one occasion he had lost control of himself completely, curling himself to the floor and chewing the edges of the carpet. Hence the term carpet eater. The evening before, while talking with some of the party leaders at the Dressen, I had heard the expression applied to the Fuhrer in whispers, of course, end of quote. In episode 34 of this series, I talked about perfect demonic possession, where the individual who has been possessed by satanic beings does not want to be freed because he is receiving many gifts from them. These can include strange knowledge and mysterious power over people. However, ultimately, the personality of such an individual begins to fragment and shatter displaying manifestations that appear like insanity. Was Hitler insane, or was it perfect satanic possession? For specific reasons, I believe that he was the clearest prototype yet of a perfectly possessed world leader who is still to come. The Bible calls him the Antichrist, Satan's Messiah. When we view the manifestations of evil that came from Hitler, I think we get a glimpse of Satan's personality and values. Also, we can see how other leaders today are operating under perfect possession. This is an important supernatural pattern of hell. Consequently, it's vital that we understand what was really going on all those years ago. I'm going to share information in this episode that I'm sure you've never heard before. It has been consciously forgotten and we need to remember it. It's found in a rare book entitled The Voice of Destruction, Conversations with Hitler, published in 1940. The author was a man named Hermann Rauschning. In 1933, with the full support of Hitler and the Nazis, Rauschning was elected president of the Senate in the free city of Danzig. Hitler was interested in him because of his political power in that city. Also, Rauschning fully supported Hitler's aim of taking complete control of neighboring Poland. However, 
Rauschning was filled with revulsion and absolutely hated Nazi anti-Semitism. During this period, he had many conversations with Hitler. These he wrote down and published in his book, along with impressions that he had received of this evil man. In the mid-1930s, Rauschning resigned from the Senate and supported anti-Nazi candidates. Instantly, he was in personal danger. Fearing for his life, he escaped across Europe, finally arriving in the United States, where he became an American citizen, dying in 1982. Extracts from the Voice of Destruction were presented as evidence during the Nuremberg Trials. For years, Rauschning's book was considered an important historical document. But something happened shortly after his death. A Swiss researcher named Wolfgang Hannel investigated Rauschning and announced to the world that the entire book was a fake. This was supported by another researcher named David Irving. Many believed them, so much so that the book was discredited and almost disappeared. But there was a serious problem with those men. Both were Holocaust deniers dedicated to expunging all guilt from the Nazis. They were so serious in their commitment to rewriting history that they were members of an organization dedicated to Holocaust denial. Their work was fully supported by a man named Mark Weber from the Institute for Historical Review, which has been a leading voice of the international Holocaust denial movement. Weber published an article condemning Rauschning's book as fraudulent, which led to a neo-Nazi campaign to deny all of Rauschning's writing. Weber has referred to the Holocaust as a hoax. This pro-Nazi sewage attempting to destroy the book means that we should take the voice of destruction very seriously. It is an age-old satanic strategy to destroy truth by having it attacked by so-called experts and authoritative voices. In the book, there is a lot of historical material that is of no interest for our discussion. My focus is on its descriptions of Hitler, what Rauschning observed about his beliefs and personality. In particular, our focus will be on the strange effect he had on the people who met him. But let's start by talking about his view of war, because it is essential to understanding the man. I'm a former infantry officer and a veteran of Vietnam, where I led a rifle platoon in combat. I can tell you from personal experience that no one hates war like someone who has seen young men die and has sent their bodies home in bags. I have done that. No sane military or governmental leader on any level loves war. Adolf Hitler was a decorated German hero of World War I. He had seen thousands of German soldiers die. He had performed the most dangerous missions as a courier crawling out of the trenches and running across open fields under fire to take messages from one commander to another. In this, he was miraculously successful where most others were killed. But he was wounded and spent time in a hospital. At one point, an unseen voice told him to move away from a particular position. He did so. Moments later, a shell landed, and the soldiers at that location were killed. Hitler was temporarily blinded in a gas attack. Over 45 months and 36 major battles, he displayed conspicuous bravery. His regiment suffered 3,754 casualties, including several of Hitler's friends. All of this played a critical role in Hitler's spiritual transformation. At the beginning of the war, he was described as a nice guy who liked to read, write poetry, and paint in his off hours. He came out enraged with a hellish confidence never seen in him before. An ironic twist is that he was recommended for an Iron Cross First Class, one of Germany's highest honors, by a Jewish commander a fact he tried to hide throughout his career. In spite of all this, in Rauschning's book we confront the amazing reality that Hitler passionately loved war and believed that he had the perfect right to use any weapon 
including weapons of mass destruction to win. There were no moral barriers within him to inflicting any form of death on anyone. He didn't care how many people died. His arrogance even destroyed any concern for his own country's welfare. Does that remind you of Vladimir Putin or Stalin or Mao or thousands of other leaders? Within Hitler, there was the breathtaking, absolute blind faith that he would be victorious no matter what. Here is what Hitler, the veteran of military horror, said about war, and I quote, War is the most natural, the most everyday matter. War is eternal, war is universal. There is no beginning and there is no peace. War is life. Any struggle is war. War is the origin of all things. Let us go back to primitive life, the life of the savages. What is war? but cunning deception, delusion, attack, and surprise. People have killed only when they could not achieve their aim in other ways. Merchants, robbers, warriors, at one time, all these were one." End of quote. This is the philosophy of hell that has been at the heart of worldwide destruction. Satan loves war and hates peace. He and his forces have been at war with God for eons. Satan loves human wars and instigates them through leaders that are under his control. The more suffering and death that war brings, the happier he is. Why is this so? Because he knows that God loves this world full of people so much that he sent his only son Jesus to pay the price with his own blood to set us free from enslavement to Satan and his horde. Satan hates freedom. But here is the ultimate insanity. I think Satan, in his arrogance, still believes that he can win. So it's logical that those he perfectly possesses both share in his blindness and will share in his fate. Adolf Hitler viewed himself as a military genius, far above any leader who had ever lived. At one point he was asked how he intended to win against Western powers, including the United States, after the horrors of World War I. Here is what he said. And I quote, Our real wars will in fact all be fought before military operations begin. In Hitler's mind, a good example was the use of bacterial warfare in peacetime. His plan was to infect commercial travelers who went to target countries. I quote him again, The results would not be immediate. It would take several weeks, if not longer, for an epidemic to appear. Perhaps we shall introduce bacteria at the height of the war, at the moment when the powers of resistance of the enemy are beginning to fail." End of quote. Also, he predicted that he would send in his forces in disguise, dressed in the uniforms of a target country's soldiers. In this way, his armies would march in and take control without a fight. This is Satan's historic strategy place representatives in positions of authority on every level, from government, to the military, to business, to entertainment, to sports, to the church, and beyond. Most are his unwitting servants, but some are not. He uses all of them to undermine a country, bringing chaos, violence, and hopelessness to the point that a nation can be described as demon-possessed. That's the situation in America right now but it's going on all over the world. As a tactic, it leads to satanic victory. I quote Hitler again, Our strategy is to destroy the enemy from within, to conquer him through himself. End of quote. Nowhere has this been more effective than in the Christian church. Throughout the world, Satan's well-placed, talented, attractive leaders, fake Christians, every one of them, have destroyed so much of the true ministry of Jesus Christ through this world. They have convinced Christians that they must apply the tactics of Satan to re-establish their moral authority. In the process, they have been trained to use any immoral action to achieve that goal. What kind of ultimate leader rises from such evil chaos? What motivates him? Omid Adolf. I quote him again, I shall shrink from nothing. No so-called international law, no agreements will prevent me from using 
any advantage that offers. The next war will be unbelievably bloody and grim, but the most inhuman war, one which makes no distinction between military and civilian combatants, will at the same time be the kindest, because it will be the shortest. Together with the fullest use of our arms, we shall grind down our enemy with a war of nerves. The little man of the middle class will acclaim us as the bearers of a just social order and eternal peace. None of these people any longer want war and greatness, but I want war." End of quote. In episode 34 of this series, I talked about what it's like to be in the presence of a powerful individual who is perfectly possessed. What was it like to meet Adolf Hitler? Well, he was not physically attractive. His passionate followers said his eyes were deep blue. Rauschning states that they were neither deep nor blue. He had a deep, dead, staring look. His voice was harsh, guttural, and threatening. Yet somehow, there was magic in his personality. Rauschning believed that he made the strongest impression on people who were highly suggestible or were accustomed to hero worship. In human culture, we are constantly programmed to worship heroes in sports, business, entertainment, politics, and religion. The manner in which it is done is nothing less than brainwashing. Disturbingly, Rauschning observed that Hitler had a special appeal for many women. At the very start of his career, when still a young man after World War I, he was discovered by society ladies who pushed him forward. They were the wives of great industrialists who secretly gave him money. I quote Rauschning, Women's gushing adulation, carried to the pitch of pseudo-religious ecstasy, provided the indispensable stimulus that could rouse him from his lethargy. In the struggle for power, it was the women's vote that brought Hitler to triumph. In the mass meetings in every town, the front rows were always filled with elderly women. The SS, who guarded the hall at these meetings, called them the varicose vein squad." End of quote. Did Hitler believe in God? In his speeches, he often spoke of the Almighty and Providence. But what God did he mean? He meant the Aryan Superman. And to Hitler, though he wasn't Aryan, he himself was the personification of that deity. Total arrogance is always based on self-worship. And self-worship really means worshiping Satan. For Hitler, there was a terrible price to be paid to the God he worshiped. Rauschning reports horrifying scenes. I quote him, Hitler often wakes up in the middle of the night and wanders restlessly to and fro. Then he must have light everywhere. Lately he is sent at these times for young men who have to keep him company during these hours of manifest anguish. A man in the closest daily association with him gave me this account. Hitler wakes up at night with convulsive shrieks. He shouts for help. He sits on the edge of his bed as if unable to stir. He shakes with fear, making the whole bed vibrate. He shouts confused, totally unintelligible phrases. He gasps as though imagining himself to be suffocating. My informant describes to me in full detail a remarkable scene. I should not have credited such a story if it had not come from such a source. Hitler stood swaying in his room, looking wildly about him. He, he, he's been here, he gasped. His lips were blue. Sweat streamed down his face. Suddenly began to reel off figures and odd words in broken phrases, entirely devoid of sense. It sounded horrible. Then he stood quite still, only his lips moving. He was massaged and offered something to drink. Then suddenly he broke out. There! There in the corner! Who's that? He stamped and shrieked in the familiar way. He was shown that there was nothing out of the ordinary in the room. Then he gradually grew calm. After that he lay asleep for many hours. End of quote. That was the terror of the perfectly possessed. 
as the core of his being crumbles. But Hitler still had Satan's gifts. One of them was power over people. Rauschning reports that visitors to Hitler were charmed to the point of ecstasy by just meeting him. They considered him a genius. Men of knowledge, experience, and critical judgment were unable to speak of meeting him without deep emotion. A well-known German dramatist was looking forward with great anticipation to meeting Hitler, expecting to hear some wonderful words. Finally, he was introduced. I quote Rauschning. The Fuhrer shook hands with him and looked into his eyes. It was the famous gaze that makes everyone tremble, the glance which once made a distinguished old lawyer declare that after meeting it, he had one desire, to be back home in order to master the experience in solitude. End of quote. Hitler shook hands a second time with the dramatist. Everyone present waited expectantly for some great words that would go down in history. The Fuhrer shook hands a third time, then passed on to the next person without saying a word. Later, the dramatist told his friends that it was the greatest moment of his entire life. And there were many others who met Hitler who said the same. Rauschning struggled to understand the source of Hitler's strange control over people. Finally, he decided that the man was like a spirit medium who receives power from somewhere beyond. He wasn't wrong in that. But this power was dangerous. Frequently, men told him that they were terrified to meet Hitler. Afraid from the way he looked at them, he would suddenly spring and strangle them. The Bible describes Satan as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So it's little wonder that those he perfectly possesses communicate that charming attribute. The souls of those who give themselves to follow the perfectly possessed will be devoured in the ecstasy of hell. Nazi involvement with the occult is well known. It's been thoroughly documented in the book The Occult and the Third Reich by two French scholars of mystical European cults who jointly published under the name Jean-Michel Angebert. Hitler once said, and I quote, he who has seen in National Socialism only a political movement has seen nothing. The authors of the book state, and I quote them, The time has come once and for all to call to account those who refuse to see in Nazism anything but a political system. Nazism is only the most recent outcropping of a militant neo-paganism locked in a death struggle with its arch enemy. Christianity, a struggle which will go on to the end of time." End of quote. The evil spirit out of which Nazism grew is erupting again with great power. But it won't manifest in the same guise, so people will not recognize it until it's too late. I believe there is strong evidence that we are moving quickly toward the final confrontation between Satan and Jesus Christ, the Eternal King. To command Satan's evil forces, the ultimate perfectly possessed human leader will appear. Here is how the Apostle Paul describes all of this in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 to 12. Let no one in any way deceive you, for the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, 
so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness." End of quote. A deluding influence. Certainly that is what took control of Germany under Hitler. But for decades, the apostasy of German Christians had prepared the way for that delusion. What is apostasy? It's turning away from the truth. In the Christian church across cultures and centuries, apostasy from biblical teaching and faith has gone hand in hand with the rise of wolves in the church and satanically empowered governmental leaders. Before Nazism appeared, many German Christians had turned away from biblical Christianity. They had lost all faith in the Bible as a source of ultimate truth due to what German theologians had called higher or historical criticism. This intellectual delusion attacked the veracity of biblical sources. In the process, it created a void in spiritual authority that was easily manipulated by false leaders who syncretized and further corrupted an empty Christian faith with a desperate nationalism. The result was a demonically inspired view of the German nation. Germans were led to believe that they were God's chosen people and call themselves the Volk. When Hitler appeared, they saw him as a leader sent by God to save them. Save them from what? Powerful nations that wanted to destroy them under the leadership of Jews, and Jews were in control of Germany. So all Jews had to be destroyed to free the world from evil. And in the process, Germany would be made great again. The Christian Church helped establish Satan as their Fuhrer, the father of their nation. The record of what German Christians, both Protestant and Catholic, did and said is horrifying. It's recorded in an excellent book published by Cambridge Press in 2012. The author is the scholar Robert P. Erickson, and his work is entitled Complicity in the Holocaust, Churches and Universities in Nazi Germany. In the book, Erickson records an editorial by a national Lutheran newspaper. I quote, We get no further if we get stuck on little things that might displease us, failing to value the great things God has done for our Volk through the Nazis. For humans have not done this. An entire Volk, or at least its largest part, raising itself up into a storm, breaking the spiritual chains of many years, wanting once again to be a free, honest, clean Volk. There are higher powers at work here. The evil enemy does not want a clean Volk. He wants no religion, no church, no Christian schools. He wants to destroy all of that. But the National Socialist Nazi movement wants to build all of this up. They have written it into their program. Is that not God at work? End of quote. Here is the ultimate delusion. Believing that what Satan is giving you is from God. In that statement, take out Nazi Germany and insert the so-called Christian politics of America today. How well it fits, and that should give you a chill. Those words were written by highly intelligent, well-educated men who considered themselves devout Christians. I'm sure they honestly desired the good of their people. But because their Christian faith had been entirely syncretized with a self-serving political philosophy, and they no longer believed the Bible to be authoritative, they weren't Christians at all. In their blindness, they became servants of Satan. And as I speak, those same vile aberrations are transforming America and the world. These false Christians have forgotten Jesus' warning in Matthew 7, 21-23, where he states, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Imagine something with me. Imagine the rise of a world leader who is much more attractive than Adolf Hitler, Vladimir Putin, or any of the others. He is vastly charming and more intelligent, with amazing power to sway the hearts and minds of millions, making them believe that he is their only hope for peace and justice. In his presence, you will feel that you are being touched by God himself. Far beyond Hitler, he will appear to display the miraculous power of Jesus Christ. He will heal people. After receiving a lethal wound, he will even rise from the dead. That is how the Antichrist is described in the New Testament. He is Satan's version of Jesus, and false Christians, believing a syncretized faith, will idolize him because he will be like an angel of light in a totally dark world, perhaps a world under external attack. But this man will be perfectly possessed beyond anyone who has ever lived. And there will come a time when the truth of who he is will manifest in monstrous terror. He will love war because Satan loves war. But the real Jesus, the true King of Heaven, will destroy him with a single word from his mouth. Along with him will die all those who have put their faith in him. Hitler rose out of the most hideous war that has ever been perpetrated to that point in history. I'm no prophet, but I believe it is very possible that the Antichrist will arise out of the next terrible world war. While so many false German Christians became followers of Satan, there were faithful Christians who saw the evil and stood against it. Many paid with their lives, such as the wonderful writer Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He wrote about what he called cheap grace. That is grace that justifies the sins we commit, but not us as sinners. It's grace that we give ourselves. It's the grace of Satan. So as darkness rises around the world with satanic leaders in control of vast populations, how will you stand against evil? Well, you may say, I'm not one of those stupid religious people in Germany or America. I'm not religious at all. Nothing fools me. Forgive me a moment of dark hilarity. Disturbingly like Hitler, the non-religious person thinks he is the ultimate arbiter of truth, thereby becoming his own little god. Consequently, he is susceptible to a perfectly structured lie, what might be called compassionate practicality. Give a good non-religious person a perfectly possessed leader who makes the right compassionate economic and social decisions, and he will follow that leader to doom. Compassionate practicality is just as blind as lying religious faith. Here's why. Great evil often comes with a seductively logical, compassionate appearance that will utterly mess with your brain. By the time you realize the truth, it's too late. What is the only force that can destroy the arrogant lies of the perfectly possessed and their father, Satan? It's the humility of the one true God who humbled himself to become one of us. He didn't enter the world that first time as a conquering king which is what Satan would have done and will do. He came to share in our suffering, in our pain and our poverty. He came to give himself so that we could be set free and healed. And in that amazing humility, there is eternal love. Jesus loves you, my friend, more than you could ever understand. Is he whispering right now in your heart? If so, don't turn away from him. Tell him all your fears and sorrows. Yes, and tell him about your sin. Ask for his forgiveness. Ask him to guide you every day. He will answer that prayer. When that happens, you will enter into Jesus' kingdom of eternal love, where there is safety and joy forever. That's what I want for you. That's why we do these productions. If we can be of help, please contact us in the comments section. We will respond. As always, do like and subscribe to our channel. 
and share it with your friends. It's a great help in this crazy electronic world. Also, if you believe in what we're doing here at Thorn Crown Studios, we invite you to join us as a supporting team member. We have a Buy Me a Coffee page and a Patreon page. The links are below. Thanks so much for watching. And remember, Jesus the true King is coming. And this time, it will be in total power.